Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Cape Cultural Collective and Foundation for Human Rights webinar this afternoon. Uh, the title being Achieving Gender Justice, What Should Men and Women Do? I am Zanaria Bardens from the Cape Cultural Collective and I'm your moderator for this afternoon. We have five panelists today and they are Joy Lange, Saviwe Mini, Rumbi Chiduri, Caroline Peters and Aslam Fatah. I will be introducing them more uh, um, about them later as they speak and they will join us in that order as I've introduced them for an initial five minutes they will deliver their commentary around a particular question around the topic this afternoon. By way of introduction to this afternoon's webinar, the fight for gender justice is the fight to see all people free from cultural and interpersonal systems of privilege and oppression. Gender injustice violates human rights, constrains choice and agency, blocks access to social, political, and economic systems and structures. The impact is most severely experienced by women and girls, trapping them in toxic relationships at home and in the broader society, crushing their aspirations and development. Women and girls suffer heavily during times of conflict, are forced into marriage, experience femicide and infant infanticide. They face daily violence. Gender injustice hinders the, the achievement of just and equitable relationships between men and women in order to achieve fair, sustainable and resilient communities. It not only fails women and girls, it fails men and boys too. Men and boys are trapped into reproducing these power relations in a patriarchal system which impacts so severely on women, but also on men. Often it is women who are at the forefront of organizations and initiatives that address gender-based violence or GBV, as we've come to shorten that too. While this is important for women's agency, it reinforces the notion that GBV is to be tackled by women alone. However, we know that men are the major perpetrators of acts of GBV. So the question is whether, as women, we can tackle the scourge of GBV without involving men. We have a panel today who will be responding to this particular question. And just to make clear, when we speak about men and women, we also include non-gender conforming individuals who don't subscribe to either calling themselves men or women, but generally what can human beings do? But the reason we've placed emphasis on men is, as I've said, generally speaking, these particular struggles have been seen to be the business of women only, and we are wanting to challenge this particular notion. So to start us off this afternoon, I will introduce Joy Langer, who is the executive director of St. Anne's Homes, a short-term care facility for abused, pregnant and homeless women with their children. The question Joy will be answering is what should be done to advance the fight for gender justice? And can we address GBV without involving men? I will request that any questions that our audience has to be placed either on the Facebook live page, if you're on Facebook, or in the chat within the uh, Zoom function. Thanks, Joy. Please proceed. Thank you, Zanari, and good afternoon, everyone. So uh, to answer the first question, what should be done to advance the fight for gender justice? I think it's um, we need to get to a multi-sectoral approach in order to advance uh, gender justice. 
And um, I have listed uh, examples to e explain what I mean by the multi-sectoral approach. Um, in your introduction, uh, Zanaria, you spoke about um, strengthening movements. And so I'm part of uh, the national shelter movement. And so um, we really need to strengthen the women's movement and gender non-conforming uh, people to achieve social justice. And a recent example of this is that the national shelter movement uh, decided to write an open letter to the president. And two weeks ago, we actually addressed it in his address in parliament, where we actually listed the injustices that was taking place in uh, the Eastern Cape with regards to women sheltering and the funding thereof, which meant that services and resources in terms of gender-based violence weren't uh, given to the Eastern Cape, for example. So through strengthening the movement, we could actually assist the Eastern Cape province. Then I also think that we need to work towards eradicating the sustained oppression and marginal marginalization of rural women. Uh, when we look at our um, urban areas, we are already scrambling for services and resources. And here, um, I think of um, the West Coast. Um, the shelters, if, if there's a, a survivor of GBV, um, she, and, and for example, if the survivor is in Friedendau, for that matter, the closest shelter is almost 300 uh, kilometers away. And so the need in the urban areas is far greater and, and that's something that, that we need to highlight and address. Um, I also uh, uh, think that we need to become more gender sensitive and we need a collective approach in order to eradicate uh, gender injustice. And this means that it needs to be a collective effort between government, um, in, in the workplace, in the business world, communities and schools, in order to break the pervasive sexism, the patriarchal norms that exist, and also to break down the attitudes and beliefs that exist, which further exacerbates the gender injustice. Um, then your, the second question was, can we address GBV without, involve, without involving men? And the quick answer to that is no, we won't be able to address GBV and hence we've been struggling with it um, so much as a country. We need to be engaging men and boys more around the topic um, of gender-based violence and just in terms of gender as such. Uh, and once we do this, I believe that we will start addressing the root causes of uh, gender-based violence, which will shift the mindsets and allow us to move forward in ending GBV over time, as it's not going to be happening overnight. Um, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, uh, Joy, for that uh, short input, and thanks for... Um, Sticking to, I think, the time, in fact, probably less than the five minutes allocated, but that just will allow us more time later for conversation. Um, and the first part of the question, Joy spoke about multi sectoral engagement, which involves government, business, civil society, including schools, etc. And she, the definitive answer was yes, we have to involve men in tackling this. Uh, issue. So I will now invite Saviwe Mini, who is based at the University of the Western Cape. He has worked at the Gender and Education Training Network, JETNEC, where his fo focus was men, the men and masculinities project. So Saviwe, welcome. Um, the question to you is, how do we work with men? in addressing gender-based violence and femicide in South Africa. And if this has in fact occurred, what new approaches are required in this uh, time? Thank okay. you, Savivi. Thanks very much, uh, Zenaria. Um, good afternoon to other uh, participants. There, there are a number of organizations that have worked um, in this area, particularly in what we call 
men and masculinities. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a program that is actually seeking to tap into the consciousness of men and looking at how men um, are socialized and, and how in society uh, men are gendered, you know, that sort of thing. Because, you know, remember, we um, seek to tease out the meaning of what does being gendered as a man actually do to men in society. So the number of organizations that, that are doing that have been, uh, when I worked at JetNet, I was responsible for that together with other colleagues. Um, and largely, um, there, there would be also other organizations that we, we will collaborate with uh, both here and nationally and international, kind of looking at these particular things. Part of what we were doing was firstly doing something called gender mainstreaming. In other words, how do we pull in the issue of gender and, and desegregate it and then pull some, uh, you know, um, handles out of that to say, okay, so how do we uh, uh, take men along with us so that they're beginning to think differently from how men are socialized, particularly in a male, uh, masculine, um, absolutely misogynistic um, society like South Africa, where we live. And we would then essentially go into communities, go into organizations, go into various structures and then work with, um, with men. And typically what we'll do is we'll run workshops, we will also run workshops with government departments. At some point, we'll go straight into where the, there used to be something called gender machinery all the way in, in, in the office of the, you know, the president. And then we'll run all sorts of workshops to highlight you know, all of that. And I think over the years, I mean, we've kind of, I've kind of looked at this. And some of us, uh, myself and other colleagues who work in this field, have begun to feel a little bit um, that we're not making the impact that we are. I mean, I think, I think on the one side, it's not only just, you know, uh, our societies that become much more, you know, sexist and various other things. But I think at the bottom line, I think we were, and I think we still are, it's almost like you're putting a little bit of a plaster, you know, a little plaster in a big wound that these efforts and, and whatever thing that we are, we are trying to engage with, so it's really making any difference, or it's making very little difference, particularly when you're dealing with um, increase in femicide in South Africa, um, increase in, in gender-based violence, um, violence uh, targeted at people who are gendered other than um, how I'm gendered. You know, all of those kind of things have begun to, to surface. To an extent that one now is beginning to say, okay, how do we begin? In fact, perhaps, our strategies may have been informed by a, you know, engaging men and boys, you know, in, in terms of gender-based violence. Um, in other words, we would primarily focus on, this is what we want to do, on um, violence before it happens. So in other words, before uh, it happens, then you, you know, begin to do something, you know, you work with men, etc. But the, I think the second strategy would be uh, what, you, what I would call secondary um, prevention. In other words, once violence has happened, so in a community where we know that violence is taking place, we begin to say, okay, now let's relook at this and then take, you know, and run a workshop there. Maybe at a third level would have been um, what, what I would call at a tertiary level, third level, where we respond after everything is occurred and make, making sure that it doesn't happen again. So those are the issues. But I think we need to go deeper, okay? Because we need to understand that gender-based violence is related to power and control. And that in society today, there are specific institutions that are particularly entrenching um, the, men, the, the role of men uh, so that they continue to have the power that they have. So I think we need to look at those institutions. One of those, I think later on is going to come up maybe, um, is the issue around um, how religion plays, uh, you know, perpetuates all of this. Um, families, actually, how boys are, and men are, you know, engage in that space. So it's, it's, it's actually dealing with institutions, key institutions of society that seek to, do, to deal with this. And then, of course, not only just institutions, which I can name a range of them, but I think it's also going to do with culture 
and, and how culture is perpetuated from one generation to the next generation to an extent that men are gendered to be violent. Um, the, 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 the cultural setup that we are exposed to is one that actually seeks to, unless we, we, we tap into that, I think one of, one, that's one of the things I'm going to do. I think before I keep quiet, just I want to throw this one as well in, and that in a society where a, you know, there is an appreciation and then people um, who are gendered differently, uh, men, women, gays, lesbian, um, transgendered, I think that's where we need to pull all of this into that space as well, so that we begin to tap into the space. One of the things I'm exploring then is how schooling is dealing with this. So we need to get into the education system and then pull this thing apart so that when boys begin to enter the schooling system, and as well as combined with other various efforts as pointed out by Joy, then we begin to have a generation of men that would look differently, that would do things differently. And we'll, I think it, when, when that happens, gender-based violence and femicide will decrease in this country. But scenario, I think I'll probably stop uh, there. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Saviwe. You've spoken about the intergenerational nature of this problem, the fact that it's systemic, uh, the fact that um, there need to be various levels at which this is, is dealt with. And you've particularly spoken about the institutional frameworks that where these um, uh, GBV in fact flourishes and is not really challenged. Um, we will be having someone uh, responding to that particular question uh, in the course of this afternoon, but I just want to park that you have already raised that uh, particular uh, a, a question or as an issue. So I will now um, welcome Rumbi Chiduri, who is the Gender Coordinator of the Foundation for Human Rights. As you would have heard if you joined us earlier uh, today, the Foundation for Human Rights is our partner in presenting this webinar today. So it gives me pleasure to welcome Rumbi with this particular question. Rumbi, how do we create equitable, respectful partnerships and ways of engaging on the issue of gender-based violence? And here I'm referring to both individuals and between organizations, between individuals and also between organizations. Thank you, Rumbi. You may uh, into the frame. Thank you, Zina, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think um, the COVID pandemic has actually given us perspective uh, in that for humanity to survive, we need to work collaboratively. Um, we are actually stronger together, if you will. So for us to be able to, 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 to find a solution to, to this pandemic that we're facing, we've, rea we've realized that we actually need to work together. It's important that we understand that, you know, everything um, gets done through relationships. Uh, transformative movements in themselves recognize that everything is done through relationships. Movements get done through relationships. Movements about, are about people, cultures are about people, and our relationship with each other and with the environment. And we have to learn that everything intersects with one another and we're somehow all connected to each other. So the only authentic partnerships can only make a difference or can only transform attitudes and behaviors if we have shared goals and expectations, transparency, support for each other, recognition of the different contributions that partners bring to the table. And these will in themselves lead to collective vision, coordinated strategy, and ultimately collective impact. I mean, a good example of that is the partnership that we have with you, the cultural collective, and also as the foundation for human rights. We are sort of in the business of, cre of assisting partnerships and enabling partnerships. We understand that, you know, building partnerships takes time and it's important especially when we're looking at issues like gbv we know that south africa is a very violent society 
and to deal effectively with this problem, there really needs to be a complete shift, a complete culture shift in the way, in, in the manner in which res we respond to GBV. We all need to be accountable. Accountability is very important. I think we've seen that in the manner in which even as the pandemic has unfolded, we have seen the response that has been, um, um, the response that has the government has given in terms of COVID-19. In some instances, there wasn't much consultation that happened. For instance, when the lockdown happened, there wasn't much uh, uh, investment into looking at organizations that provide services to GBV for them to be recognized as essential services. And that in itself led to a number and many women not being able to access services and being left to continue to suffer abuse, especially at the hands of their perpetrators with which they were locked down with. So only after civil society had intervened and letters were written to government and consultation happened well the regulations then changed and gbv and organizations that provide GB serv gbv services to women were then uh, recognized as essential services so we can see the difference that consultation makes and we can see what happens if consultation doesn't happen harm happens and we need to understand also the intersection of issues building relationships in, entails understanding and leveraging cross impact and sharing knowledge and lessons. It's important that we understand the dynamics of race and power and privilege and how these can affect or impact on our authentic partnerships with each other. The Foundation for Human Rights recognizes that different individuals and institutions bring different types of relationships and knowledge and skills and different stakeholders can collectively develop a deeper understanding of global challenges and potential resources to them and also generate insights and evidence to inform practice, policy, and to contribute to ending GBV, poverty eradication, and also to bring about a just and equal society which is what we all aspire to do. I think I'll just end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rumbi, for that uh, input and also for the partnership that um, the Foundation for Human Rights has with the CCC. Um, it is through activities such as this that we give meaning to that partnership. Um, and I just want to also echo the fact that as uh, Rumbi says, partners bring different elements to the relationship, different skills, different capacities, different resources, but ultimately in combination, as long as there is a focus uh, and, uh, on the particular issue, then there can be progress. She also mentioned the intersection of issues, reinforcing what uh, the earlier colleagues have uh, indicated. Um, I now want to call on uh, Caroline Peters. Um, Caroline is the founder and director of the Callis Foundation and the coordinator of the Cape Flats Women's Movement. And the question that we have for Caroline today is, Caroline, what measures can be taken to improve women's access to structures and services which support them? Because we know that there are certain uh, services out there, but often people are unaware what exists. So how do we bring attention to that and how do we strengthen that? Caroline, over to you. Is Caroline there? Apologies, I started without uh, unmuting myself. The, the joys of webinars. So good afternoon, thank you Zanadia and good afternoon everyone. So the measures to be taken, what measures can be taken to improve women's access to structures and services which support them. So during COVID-19, 
we have seen, and, and I think women's access to structures and services has always been, there's always been huge challenges. And this was, was exacerbated and we saw during COVID-19 or lockdown that this just was worse during this time. However, we want, we, I want to say that women on the front line or community-based, so I'm going to speak specifically around women on the front line, women in communities, is more so because that's where, where I work. So we saw now during lockdown that women organized, how women organized, how we made sure that our communities did not go hungry, how we as women organized ourselves in groups, and, and um, often we, we, we've seen that the CBOs or the women on the ground working on the front line, we were the ones that stood out during, during the, the, the lockdown period since we started on level five. And the access that women have to structures was even, even worse during this time. I, I just want to make an example of the Gender-Based Violence Command Center that um, firstly, when we speak about access to services for women, one of the things we have seen, everybody knows that GBV increased during lockdown and there was no services because most of the bigger NGOs were not operating. And like Rumi was saying earlier, women were locked in with their, with, with their abusive partners. And this meant that, that as frontline workers, as CBOs, women would access or, or would come to our feeding schemes. In fact, the feeding schemes was a, was a, was a space where women could come, uh, come to for assistance. And, and this is where women seek assistance from because they were confined to an area, they were locked in. So that was the only service that women have access to. So we've seen during lockdown how these structures supported women. But one of the things that, that, that I want to speak about was like something especially like the GBV Command Center, that was one of the, the, the services that was supposed to be there to, to assist women during this time. We've seen, we've seen that women, they, there's, the, they, there's the immediate, um, women do not have access to data. Women do not have access. One of the GBV command centers, women couldn't be assisted in the language of their, of their choice. Women's, um, so, so, so what it meant that GBV command center was resourced by 23 million rand monthly, but we still did not see women having access to the, to, to the service. So, Again, they, they, there was a huge gap, a huge need for women to have assistance during that. Um, patriarchy or, or patriarchy enables gender-based violence. We've seen this once again during lockdown. We've seen how if, if women, so, so, so the woman would be the one in the household that make sure that the children are fed daily, the husband are fed daily. We have seen in communities how women would hustle um, since the third day of lockdown, how, how women hustle um, to, to make sure that, 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 that a family is served during lockdown. And, and once again, um, socialization. So it's about how men has been socialized, patriarchy continues, and if we, if we speak about women's access to, or, or, to services or structures, there's so many things we, we, we need to look at, Zenaria. So, so, so for instance, um, and it can start like, like um, it should start since children. When, when we speak about access structures and those things, it needs, we need to look at household chores, child care, how many women have unpaid labor, labor, all these things are, are, are challenges. Um, we, we, we need to support mothers and parents. We need to reject racist and chauvinist attitude. We need to help women to gain their power. We, we need to, to pay, well, we, we need to pay women equally for, for their work. We need to educate, we need to develop skills, we need to train, we need to have access to quality work and decent pay. So, so um, and, and, and if we look at structures, Zanadia, we need to say that all government 
insurgents must have clear strategies on how they will endure that the services reach women like I said with the GBV command center because that I had first hand experience with during lockdown which was well resourced um, women did not have access to the services women could not speak in their in, in the mother tongue uh, to these services however we have seen like you said earlier that only much later during lockdown were we acknowledged as NPOs for the work that, that we were doing during lockdown. So we see these government institutions, we have seen our president speaking about billions going to gender-based violence. This did not, not equate to services rendered to women and, and men and children. So, so for instance, to address GBV, we see big figures going around for GBV, but it is not we we do not see tangible difference on the front lines or services that women have access to so unless we we force the, the government to think about obstacles that's facing women um women's access to services will be will always be lacking so yeah i think i'll stop there zanaria thank you so much thank you caroline thanks for that um insight into what's happening on the ground in relation to women's access you've spoken particularly about the impediments such as data language and other elements which prevent women from accessing those services even though they may be there even though they may be well resourced people still women still do not access the other point you made is about socialization the way in which men and boys are basically socialized into this particular patriarchal structure not only men and boys in fact all of us are born into this particular system and how that education um, needs to take place at that level at a very young age as well so i'm going to move now to our final panelist and that is aslam fatah who is a professor of education at Stellenbosch University. And the question to you, Aslam, um, and it arose earlier when Saviwe spoke, was the role of institutions. So how can cultural and religious leaders intervene to address the reproduction of oppressive roles and misogynistic behaviors? Um, and this would be in an institutional framework i welcome you to talk about that to us thank you Asla. thank you very much zanaria um good afternoon uh, colleagues panelists uh, fellow panelists um it's uh, very good to speak to you this afternoon um i my starting comment is to say that this is a time for unequivocal uncompromising speak in uh, identifying uh, gender-based violence as probably, probably the number one problem in our society on the one hand and on the other hand what we are trying to suggest is that there are a number of strategic conversations and practices that we have to set into our communities in order to address this very important challenge let me however say unequivocally as i've um, um, indicated that uh, cultural and religious expressions, um, as um, the uh, pal uh, fellow panelist CCV has indicated, are complicit, strong word, complicit in the oppression of women in the public and domestic spheres. A religious discourse often provides justifying grounds for gender oppressive practices. And it is time for us to call attention to these complicities. Recently, in the Muslim community, women's positions in, in religion and society was brought into a very stark view by the utterances of a religious leader in an area that I actually come from, which is Parkwood Grassy Park. In a clip that circulated on social media, it was laid bare how religious language positions women as lesser than and as available to men in other words as 
less than worthy human beings. The clip received pushback. A petition immediately collected over a 24-hour period, 2,000 signatures and many comments from all over the world, but mainly Cape Town Muslim women. What the women on the petition highlighted in their comments was them suffering daily abuse inside many homes that curtail their freedom. And that a clip like this sort of elicited um, responses uh, in condemnation of those daily abuse. I want to say that uh, these injustices are seemingly, probably increasing in all religious and cultural communities, if we go by anecdotes at least. As the structural context of our lives become more precarious, desperation increases. And as the social fabric of families in these precarious circumstances begin to unravel, women take on multiple roles as providers of food and shelter, as carers, and as leaders in domestic environments. They've always done this. It's now just been exacerbated, the multiple roles. Families, in other words, are run by women, yet women are at the receiving end of psychological physical abuse, even death. It seems many men are experiencing emasculation. Big word, I try to I go for a synonym, but I think the word actually captures what I want to say. Unemployed and unable to provide, men have lost the authority in the family that earning a wage confer. In this context, bereft of socio-emotional and psychological skills, men lash out, leading to hectic increases in gender-based violence in the domestic sphere. Therefore, women are increasingly vulnerable. They live in harsh and unremitting circumstances. They confront the necessity to survive. They suffer abuse uh, as they suffer abuse from men. And theirs is a cry in the dark, a cry for help in desperate circumstances. Back to the clip. What is disappointing is that large numbers of men supported this religious, re religious leader, rationalizing his words. This, I think, indicates a current. I do not know how widespread this current is, but on social media it was amplified of current of misogynistic language circulating in the community. It is pleasing to note that this situation was called out by a statement released by Men Against Misogyny in the Muslim community. That was the name of the statement, Men Against Misogyny in the Muslim community. As men, we clearly stated our opposition in this statement to gender injustice. And we called for in-depth dialogue about reforming our practices. Gender violence and misogyny cannot be swept under the carpet. Religious communities must be encouraged to develop policy guidelines to govern the behavior of men and leaders in all spheres of life. There is a problem with the language, the religious language. There is a problem with the leaders' language and the men who follow them. Mosques and churches must therefore be encouraged to adopt sexual harassment practices. Some mosque, which pleasingly, such as the Claremont Main Road Mosque, of which I'm a member, have pleasingly two years ago already developed a fairly uh, uh, incisive set of policies to govern the religious institutional space of the mosque. Muslim family law that governs marriage, divorce, maintenance, and post-divorce settlements remains largely unregulated. And it is here where, uh, in the absence of regulation, women suffer most. Some cases that have gone through the country's court system 
that brought relief to some of these women in their marriage and divorce disputes. But this is not enough. We have to campaign for the rights of Muslim women to become part of the country's constitutional dispensation. There are two broad reasons why this hasn't happened yet. One is that the, the government is actually fearful of antagonizing Muslim men with misogynistic attitudes when they develop and incorporate Muslim personal law based on equality as the constitution prescribes in a context where these Muslim men and their judiciaries would say that is not Islamically allowed. We have to build a, uh, an alliance to resist that kind of thinking so that we can move forward. Gender does justice will not come easily. Misogyny is lodged in our communities. Its defenders are willing to use the power of holy texts and violence and its threat to retain masculine power to the detriment of women's worthy lives. And the battle for gender justice lies in all spheres of the community, in advocating for a politics of structural gender sensitive change and poverty alleviation, in changing the policies of organizations, in the daily examples that we set for our children. And by the way, we're involved in three, mad three, three madrasa religious after school, afternoon school educational spaces where we are sort of trying to develop some uh, uh, gender equity uh, syllabi uh, and training teachers in that respect at the foundation phase level for children. So there's stuff happening. This is a complex struggle that we are committing ourselves to if we want to accord God's dignity to all women. And I sort of call on all of us to kind of commit to this struggle. Thank you very much, Sinai. Thank you very much, Aslam, for your insight. Because even though you focus specifically on uh, the sort of mosques and that you are aware of, I think it is quite clear that, um, you know, institutions are uh, complicit as you've mentioned and the language and the practices are embedded in the very structure of many of these religious most religious institutions um, it was heartening to hear of the initiatives that are taking place at the three madrasas for example um, and it would be interesting to see of over a period of time with some study what impact that has what difference it would make um, so I'm going to sort of go to our audience. Here are some questions uh, in the, the chat already. And I'm relying with, on my team of helpers who are on Facebook to uh, forward more questions this way. But here is a question. Um, and I think Rumbi start thinking about it. And it may be that one or two other panelists also want to respond to this. But uh, from Mansoor is the statement and question. He says, capitalism is a system that inherently promotes inequality and injustice. Are we able to seriously advance the struggle for gender or for that matter, racial and economic justice while this economic system is hegemonic, is in place? So it's a, it's a complex question, as complex as the issue itself. Rumbi, I'll ask you to respond, and Aslam, it looks like you may have a response there as well. So I'll take your response after Rumbi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Zina, and thank you very much for, 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 for that question. Are we able to seriously advance um, the struggle for gender, for that matter, uh, racial and economic justice, whilst the system is hegemonic? hegemonic? I think we are, I think we are. Movements have been able to expose, you know, the exploitative nature of, of, of capitalism. And now we all know that capitalism in itself, it was never meant to work for, for everybody. But what movements have done is movements have been able to expose how evil and how bad capitalism is. And in that respect, we're able to understand how capitalism works and how we can deal to work against capitalism. If we believe that another world is possible, 
I think it's also possible to believe that another system, we can invest in another system that will be in it, that will enable and that is premised on justice, on equity and on respect. There is an opportunity to continue to strengthen the existing movements and build on the power of all people and especially those who are vulnerable in our societies. I think this year we are celebrating the, a good example is that this year we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which in itself is a great example of what people can achieve if we focus on our efforts and work together to advance equality, especially for men and women. The Beijing Declaration in itself remains the most progressive blueprint for advancing women's rights. So I do believe that there is a possibility to, there is, it is possible to work against capitalism. It is possible to create movements that can create a better system that works for everyone. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear your view on that. I'm sure we are. Thank you very much. I sort of can't add any more to that than what uh, we were just um, in, um, uh, treat you to and informed about. Um, just, the, just strategically, I think that the, the, the anti-capitalist critique is fundamental to position women within the kind of structural context that they find themselves in. But then the question becomes, how do you strategically move forward in this decrepit uh, structural situation? It's not just anti-capitalist, it's also the collapse of infrastructure the collapse of uh, families in relation to those collapsed infrastructure. It's quite deep. And so what, what, what we see, so we've got to mobilize all our resources. I think someone qu quoted Rumi earlier on about the mobilization of the resources that we have. And those resources are networks, building, building cross-community alliances, building inter interfaith alliances, unions, youth, um, uh, practices in schools and so on and so forth. Um, and making that happen at the at the localist of levels, as a way of speaking back to those to the bigger structural constraints. Those structural constraints are killing us. That's the reason why all of things are appearing as devastatingly as they are. But we, it is in our hands to push back, but push back very, very uh, strategically in the way we build alliances to do this. Thank you, Aslam. There's a question from. Uh... Okay. How can we counter the tendency for abusers to use culture as an excuse rather than face accountability? Saviwe, would you like to um, look at that particular, address that particular question? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that we need to acknowledge is that we, um, let, me, let, me, let me preface this by saying that uh, my name, you know, reflects a particular um, language group, so if, if you are good at that. So I'm, I, I am Kosa speaking and, and what, grew up in Guguletu, and, but I've often been told that, you know, I've got a, I belong to a particular clan, I belong to a particular culture, you know, and, and then, it, you know, it goes on and on. And then at some point I'll be linked to a particular chief or to some kind of whatever. Um, Chief, chieftainship that is there. Now the, the problem now is is that um, you know in a in a in a society that that seeks to come out of apartheid, that seeks to come out of a, a you know a, a racialized system, um, what normally happens is that people tend to articulate their culture um, under the name of we've been oppressed in the past. You know we haven't been um, exposed to uh, you know our real real culture, and what happens then is that um, they would be these custodians, so-called, of culture, and and they are in you know they find themselves as being chiefs, and they they find themselves you know having uh, pushing me to become a, a subject uh, you know uh, of some chief, and as as we know very clearly, some of these chiefs are in fact um, you know uh, well they they are the ones that maintain the system of uh, patriarchy, misogyny, et cetera, but not only just that, they're extremely violent. I mean, uh, over the last few months, we've been, you know, uh, reading about how, 
how violent some of these chiefs are and how, um, I mean, one of them ended up being locked up um, and having to serve time in jail because of violent tendencies. Now, what I've often wanted to do, um, um, and while I'm still alive and young and, and all of that, is actually get into these structures and, and, and begin a conversation at that level, you see, because if you can get these chiefs, whether they are formulated or whatever, whether they call themselves contralesa, et cetera, it doesn't matter. But I think what's important is to tap into that um, because they are purveyors of, of culture, you know, that sort of thing. And then begin to work with them and, uh, and clearly confront the manner in which, you know, they, there's a perpetuation of that. And I know, I mean, I, when we work and, you know, with, with other co colleagues and comrades, one of the things that we, we confronted with is where do we start when we begin to do this? But I believe that it has to be a multi-pronged approach. But I think we need to work with these chiefs. However, they are. we need to target them and, and enter that space where they are because it's going to happen there. The second thing, obviously, would be to to say how do we enter into the so-called cultural groups, um, you know, and, and get into that space. Let me make an example. Um, in the townships of like Kukuletu, Langanyanga, et cetera, you know, um, you, you find organizations that are exclusively for men and, you know, they, they are, you know, some, you know, they, they parade themselves as, you know, whatever, the blas or, you know, and, my own conversations with them have always been to, to say, how do we begin to confront their own tendencies about the perpetuation of, you know, of, of organizations that are exclusively for men and are not necessarily seeking to address the issues around that. So I think for me, it needs to get into that and, and attack the system as it were. Earlier, I talked a lot, a lot about education, but I'm not so sure to an extent really is the, the, the new dispensation, particularly whether you're talking about basic education, um, ministry, or even higher education. The question has always been for me, how do we um, reformulate? Even when a young person, as a young person goes into the school to acknowledge that there would be things that, um, that we seek to put into the curriculum, to address issues of culture, because I think at the moment people are dancing around it instead of going straight into it. I think those three, for me, I, I just want to what I want to throw out there. Thank you, thank you very much, Sabine. It's a very complex uh, issue indeed, and uh, addressing it, as you say, to get into those structures. Of course, there's the rub, um, but undoubtedly in order to tackle it, one has to tackle it where it exists and get into those particular uh, institutions and uh, systems. Here's a question from Jamia, which I'm going to ask Caroline to, to uh, address. Caroline, um, there's a new comprehensive sex education curriculum for schools. Uh, there's been much resistance to this from conservative religious groups. Now, is such a curriculum something that can help with regard to addressing issues of how boys are gendered to be violent and attitudes uh, around gender-based violence more general, generally? If not, what else uh, can be done? Caroline, would you care to venture a response? And if any of the other panelists want to also respond to that, please let me know. Yeah, thank you, Zenodia. You know, one of the things that we've seen lately was that young men of 18 and 19 are getting into trouble with having consensual sex with girls of 14 and 15. So we just had a discussion two days around this because there was this huge resistance towards sex education. Now sex education, it's a comprehensive, and that's why it says comprehensive sex education, which will then also speak about socialization and gender and things. We've seen on the Cape Flats how young girls are, um, are, are having consensual sex, but then but because the boys are 18, we've seen it right now last weekend where parents came to say, but these children had but the doctor, because of the sexual offenses bill, the doctor's mandate is to report when there's a young girl pregnant, 
and the father is 19 and the girl is 14. So too many young men and for that reason as well. So it's not just, you know, if, if, if we see, if, if we see the, 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 so young boys and young men are getting into trouble just, just because of that. So many parents are so opposed to it. I mean, we've had religious people, whether it was Christians or Muslim quoting quotes from the Bible, and we can say abstain and there's the ABC and all that, but the reality is that children are sexually active from a young age. So for me, prevention is better than cure. Young boys, well, they know what the consensual age is for. Again, we see, you look at the prisons, the color of the men in the prisons are black. Most, most people, so we're sending our young boys and they come back because they've been in this toxic masculine environment and they come back even more violent, perpetrating even worse crimes. So for me, just speaking on GBV, this will help us to eradicate GBV. I mean, the, 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 the churches and those that supposed to it, I, I, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a believer. Um, however, there's just, yeah. So, so for me, it's about education. So if we want to tackle gender-based violence, it is, it is so, it, every, it, it's a, everybody needs to be, um, yeah, involved with this and especially religious leaders because they have a platform to dismantle that. But specifically, um, sex education will start there um, to, to dismantle gender-based violence. Thanks, Anaria. Thank you, Caroline. Would any of our other panelists want to add to the, the response with regard to this uh, question? Joy? Sorry. I just also wanted to add to what uh, Caroline was saying in terms of the comprehensive education. We also come from a history and historically and traditionally, we, sex is not a, a topic that is easily uh, spoken about or addressed within the, the home environment, uh, let alone within the institutional religious uh, uh, spaces. And so um, we are experiencing, or therefore we're experiencing the pushback with regards to the comprehensive sex education. But I want to agree with Caroline in terms of saying this is a, a, another tool or mechanism in terms of how we can um, start to be addressing uh, gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you. So another site of struggle, clearly. Um, Everything in relation to this will be a site of struggle. Um, nothing is ever a straightforward, but thanks for your responses. Here's a question or a comment from Tyron. Uh, he says, whilst the discourse is centered on a macro scale at local level, it would appear that women are not sufficiently engaged or are being empowered to what is happening at a local level. The municipal IDP processes come to mind. How can we begin to ensure that this process makes it easy for women to sufficiently participate in this process? Um, I'm going to ask Caroline to respond to that because it's about, once again, structures and systems. But if any of the other panelists have a response, Caroline, would you care to respond to this particular question, please? Caroline? Okay, Caroline, um, maybe on mute still. So can I ask uh, Aslam to respond to this particular question, if you are aware of these particular IDP processes? Can any of our panelists There's an area I'm not. That? So I'm not going to respond to that, but while we wait for Caroline, can I respond to the previous one in, on school curricula? Look, I mean, I when I started out as a teacher in, in 1900 and so on, uh, uh, where uh, 
Keizuran Jaffa was uh, my colleague. Uh, we were confronted with, and I was a guidance teacher, a young guidance teacher. We were confronted by religious communities of all stripes about why am I so brazenly teaching sexuality education. And I consulted with these people to try and understand what the objection was. The objection clearly was that the idea that, uh, that we are teaching children in this, in this liberal dispensation to experiment with sex and to become sexually active. That, that was the criteria. But then on, 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 on trying to scratch beyond the surface, it, it felt like the objections were located within the religious language. And it was located within fairly un, uh, unproble unproblematic religious assumptions that one once was able to make separations for, for, for people about what the relationship is between the sexuality education content that you'll be teaching, how you will be, uh, how you will be introducing it in a, kind of a, in a kind of a scaffolded way, at which age you teach, what you teach, and so on, about responsible sexual uh, decision-making and so on and so forth. That I, my suggestion is that we have to have that conversation. We cannot just go to communities and say, we are now going to have comprehensive sexuality education. They will come with the religious presuppositions and they will close that door down. And so as you introduce this notion, you've also got to take the community by the hand and explain to them what you're doing and then walk them through the process. You can just imagine um, how we've had to think seriously about teaching sexuality education in the madrasa syllabus for uh, five, six, seven, eight, and nine year olds. There it was a case of understanding what the religious discourse allows and doesn't allow in a, in a misogynistic, paternalistic sense, and then to chip away at that, at, that, at that language and to find points at which you can insert an alternative. And once you find it and it makes sense for people, then this space opens and, 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 it's worth, and it's worthwhile to have that conversation in a more structured way. Thanks. I'd like to also ask Rumbi uh, to respond to this particular question. Thanks, Aslam. Thank you very much, Sina. I also just wanted to add, and I agree with uh, what the previous speakers have, have, have said, and to also add to that, I wanted to say, you know, when we're talking about um, uh, sex education and issues of consent, it's very important that people get to understand what consent really means. And when we're talking about sex education, these are things that young people really need to be engaged on so that we may be able to prevent um, sexual violence from happening in the future. I think it's a very good prevention strategy. But I also realize that sometimes the resistance to, to, to policies also comes from a lack of understanding parents have not also been engaged in meaningful conversations in terms of what exactly does this uh, policy say? What does it mean to introduce it um, into the school curriculum? So I think it's very important that people are, get to be on the same page. Only then will we be able to, 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 to move forward. If parents don't understand what it is about, then it's going to be very difficult to introduce it into the schools and get them to, to be on the same page. So it's very important. Um, when you talk to issues about violence, violence is a learned behavior. So it's definitely something that can be unlearned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rumi. Um, Kay makes a comment, Kay Jaffa makes a comment where she says, um, in relation to the comprehensive sex education curriculum is not enough on its own. GBV is not about sex, but is rooted in a culture of gender inequality. And gender equality should be mainstreamed through the education curricula and system. And I think this has been coming through the various uh, presentations uh, which the um, panelists have made. There was also, I believe it was taken off Facebook, I saw it earlier, and I'm just going to throw this out there, where um, a comment I believe was made on Facebook, I'm not seeing it, um, that how do men get involved when women's organizations do not let men in uh, to these organizations? Um, and as we know, with the rise of feminism and understanding these issues of patriarchy and so on, many organizations, uh, women formed many organizations. Even in our own country, there were organizations formed like uh, the Federation of South African 
women and so on to tackle the issue of passes. You all know the 9th of August, March, those were women's, powerful women's organizations, not necessarily focused on GBV, but certainly on issues that um, uh, affected women. So we know that that is uh, uh, the history of those organizations. Can we uh, have organizations which men and women are part of? And we've heard this issue of mansplaining. I don't know if me, uh, people have heard this term, where, where men tend to silence women in organizations. So the question is, how, if that is the case, how do we ensure that women who are the victims primarily are supported and not silenced in those spaces in taking forward these struggles? Um, I'd like Joy to respond to that particular question. And then also I'll ask one of the other panelists to also respond. How do we prevent women from being silenced when men and women come together into these? Uh, I think we first, for me, we first need to look at um, leveling the playing fields in terms of gender um, equity. Uh, when we have men and women step into those spaces to address the issues. I think it's clear for us where we come from that um, we cannot ignore the fact that, uh, yes, there are some uh, um, women's organizations that started with women alone, but uh, where we find ourselves today with the um, high levels of gender-based violence and femicide, we cannot um, allow for men not to be part of the conversation and the discussions because men bring an important um, perspective to um, the issue just as what women bring and um, it is uh, uh, critical that we start engaging men um, because men can also better engage other men in the, those spaces um, as well. I'll hand over to um, one of the other panelists. Okay. Um, Caroline, you would like to respond to that? Yes, thank you, Zenaria. You know, uh, many, years at the, uh, many years ago with the Western Cape Network on Violence Against Women, we decided that we will only have women in leadership because of that same word that you use. What do you call that? Mansplaining, whatever. However, that so down the line, that change, and now we're in leadership with the Network on Violence Against Women. Um, did we have men in leadership? Because of that, men come into the space and they take over. Men come into the space and women, because historically, if we go back, historically, we are told by leaders, by religious leaders, and remember, you're on the Cape Flats, it is we, we, religion is a big part of our history and, and who we are. And so we get preached and taught in churches that we need to submit to men. We need to, you know, those lessons are quite clear in our, in our makeup, in the way we are raised. So immediately a woman that would be very dominant and out there would stand back because there's a man in the space. I was elected onto an in an organization, you know, when you left leadership, I was the only female in a sports federation. And immediately the men asked me to be the secretary. And I said, oh, no, I'm a leader, you know, just like you. But those are the things that happen when men, so just when men arrive in our spaces, just a year ago, there was a meeting at the Sarki Batman Center in the hall upstairs. We were all women in the room and there was two men and the one man in, and we were probably about 30 participants. The one man in the room's hand was up all the time. So like many of them said before, yeah, halafat were, halafat were, they don't just come alongside us and keep quiet and learn and observe like we would if we go into their spaces. So men take over in our spaces. 
And just quickly what, what um, Kay said earlier about the sex education. Yes, we know that the sex education, the comprehensive sex education in, in the department at the moment, it's not just about GBV because we know, like Saviwe said earlier, that um, abuse is about power and control, but sex education will be will enhance the, the 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 patriarchal norms even because we know that once again patriarchy um is equal to gender-based violence thank you zanaria thank you lots of passion coming through there from caroline and the comment which she quoted from fatima uh Shabudin is uh with where fatima says in the chat uh, the struggle for women's freedoms requires that men be enrolled to support the struggles led by women. So, uh, Saviwe, on that uh, note, could you comment on that particular uh, issue? Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, they, I mean, I think Fatima is spot on. Um, because, I see, the, the important thing that I acknowledge, firstly, as someone who's gendered as a man, is that I have inherent power within me and, and that power can be violent. Um, so, and I've got to go through an understanding of that before I can engage in any form of, you know, um, engagement. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I think men themselves should actually embrace feminism um, as an ideological um, stance where, they're beginning to, to look at themselves differently because feminism for me is, is an ideology. It speaks about how do we um, tackle issues of patriarchy. That's the second thing for me. And I think all men who claim to be anti-violence against women, etc., etc. I think the important thing is we need to question that. We need to caution in terms of how, to what extent have, have, have those men have got into that space. And I think the third thing for me is, is that here am I, I mean, I, one of the things I sincerely believe in is that I want to move from a, a society, I want, you know, that is patriarchal to a society that is egalitarian, that is seeks to put the equality of men and women. Now, with, with, with doing that, there has to be also um, the removal of all these other structures. And I think it must have been a question from um, Mansoor, which has been discussed already which speaks into um, how, do you do, how do you do that with, alongside cap a capitalist society? How do you do that? Because you know, capitalism um, by its very nature is violent towards women. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't pity, it doesn't put women on the same scale. So women are always exploited under capitalism and that we know that patriarchy um, precedes even capitalism. There was patriarchy before ca the system of capitalism that we find in, in society today. So for me, the important thing is, I think the, the struggle has to be waged by men themselves. Men have to go through the process, in search of a better word, of them being transformed in order to gain the space in, to work alongside women who are much more powerful. So for me, there are many women organizations that I know of, that I support and work with, but it's a space that belongs to them. And it's never a space that, that I could claim for myself. I think Aslam also wants to comment on this particular um, question. Aslam, please go ahead. Thank you very much. This is uh, a question that challenges uh, me, and I think it should challenge all men. The question is um, 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 if your participation as a man closes down the, the, the space for the surfacing of of women as the leaders as the and as the invoices of their own experiences and leading through those experiences society society's responses right so then what is the uh, the the the, uh, the um, role of men uh, underneath that um, and so my first answer to that is that on the one hand I accept that proposition on the other hand I have to figure out how to become part of a conversation where I'm positioned in a particular way it's about uh, being the best of listeners, listeners not in a kind of an airy fairy sense, but really trying to get inside of, of a debate. Well, it's also about being the kind of family, occupational, professional person where 
you become part of the distribution of aspiration and opportunity that doesn't run to you and from you, but runs via other people. It's about understanding how you are patriarchically located within a space. You have grown up in a particular way and have gender norms that favor you. It's about men shutting up because they love to talk as I do and having to shut up and listen and fall, fall in line. But it's fundamentally about men working out in relation to that particular location, how they can contribute best without, again, adding to a, a, form, of, a, a form of inequity uh, that they, in the first place, given good intention, what wanted to wanted to avoid in the first place. So it is a very precarious one. But I also agree with the previous speaker is that men should be speaking to men about this, right? And stop preaching to women. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm speaking. To, uh, I'm, I'm giving myself some important advice as well. Well, thank you uh, to all of the speakers who commented on that, and particularly for that last comment. Men should be speaking to men. That is possibly something that we don't see a lot of, and possibly it's something that Saviwe was referring to in that the workshops that they conducted with men in relation to uh, gender-based violence and uh, socialization and patriarchy. Uh, here's a comment by Ruby Marx, and she says, it's so important to remind ourselves that this is a fight against patriarchy, an ideology that says men are superior to women. We need to focus on patriarchy as an interlocking system of oppressions that men and women can dismantle. And men need to be reminded that fighting against patriarchy can lead not to loss, but immense gain and restoration. It's not a zero sum game for men. So thank you for that comment. I think this is obviously an area which is going to be quite a uh, complex or complicated one. Um, and possibly examples we can think of that relate are, say for example, Black Lives Matter. And who leads the Black Lives Matter conversation or campaign or struggle? It doesn't mean that others cannot be involved or in support of, but we can see who is meant to lead a struggle around something where they are the primary uh, victims. So possibly that is, um, uh, you know, instructive in that sense. Um, we are heading to the end of what is clearly a conversation that possibly should uh, continue. Uh, but for today, we are going to be uh, ending this uh, conversation uh, at in the next 12 minutes. So I've got one final question and possibly here is a closing remark for each of the, the panelists. What else can be done to advance the fight for gender justice in relation to everything that we have heard about it being multi-sectoral, about needing to engage institutions, it needing, uh, the, the fact that men should support women and not take over in, in those particular struggles, what else can be done? And what would you regard as one key uh, intervention to move this uh, struggle and conversation forward? I'll start as we began with Joy. Joy, these will also be your closing remarks as for all the panelists. Please, Joy. I think one of the, uh, we, um, all these, there was a thread that came through from um, all the panelists. But for me, what else um, could be done is that uh, from my perspective in terms of what I see um, working in the women sheltering uh, setting and sector, uh, a lot of the time people don't know their basic human right. And um, human rights is something that um, we need to start uh, really getting out there in terms of people understanding their right in terms of if we look at gender-based violence um, women come to the shelter not uh, really understanding that they've been abused because of that intergenerational thing that happens um, and only when they get to the shelter they understand that they've been abused because they grew up in those environments and so for me 
um, when we look at our constitution, it actually says that everyone has the right to um, um, safety and that um, violence um, is, uh, um, should not be perpetrated against anyone, but it's become a norm. Um, the other thing that um, is also clear for me is that we need to start breaking down and unpacking um, our traditional practices and values because that is a thread that also came through uh, throughout this that we've had um, this afternoon. And what came out at the end was um, the issue around men, um, engaging men, men engaging men. And also I liked um, the supportive uh, role um, that men can play in women's organizations. So um, from my side, I think that that's something that um, I would certainly um, look at afresh in terms of learnings that has come out um, from this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Viewing. Yes. Uh, what just, did you uh, say as your final remarks and one key intervention? Yeah, just two things. The first one was that this was this one question which was not tackled and I think came from Tyron and it's got to do with IDP. Um, I think one of the things that you know we need to revive as as activists is actually to you know is to ensure that we have a, a disruptive um, uh, mentality within us where we go into processes when IDPs have been grown up and disrupt that actually. Uh, because there you've got councillors, you've got you know, uh, men and women, men in particular who are councillors. Um, I think we should demand, make particular demands about how inclusive those um, IDPs should be and how promoting for, for women, because it's got implication for civil society and civil society organizations. A lot of, of um, my comrades here uh, work for and work through people like Caroline and others. So I think that's the first thing. And I think there has to be that disruption. disruption. My final comment is that, um, you know, we, the biggest lie that we are living with was that, you know, post 1994, there was freedom. Actually, that was a lie. We're still living in the effects of, um, I suppose, of a legacy that has destroyed us. As, as people, as women, particularly. And I think that what sustained organizations in the fight against apartheid and racism were these broad fronts that were established. And I think I would like to call if, um, if, if earlier there was a, a question about, uh, for example, the, the, the fight against gender-based violence being a, a matter of, of, of a pandemic, as someone once said, or the president, um, if, it's the, if it's the biggest struggle at the moment, if it's the huge struggle, and I think we should form huge formations right across and have the front. For me, my reference would be things like um, UDF, which is a reference. I'm not saying let's bring that, but I'm saying there's a broad front, and I think that broad front will make sure that we address these issues. At the moment, it's all kind of uh, bit, it's bit, by, bit by bit by bit. It should actually be a formidable movement. Thank you very much, Sinara. Thank you, thank you. And now I will go to Rumbi. Uh, Rumbi, I missed on one of the questions you wanted to respond to. So please include that in your closing uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zina. I think for me, the, the one thing that really, really sticks out um, is that we need to be able to, to, to recognize our own privilege we need to be able to recognize that even as we come together, we have different priorities, we have different capacities, we have different schedules. And if we assume that we are all on the same level playing field, we are not going to make the impact that we want. We are going to actually obstruct the ways of working together. So we really need to, to understand each other as partners, where we are coming from, where we are, what our priorities are, and that's when we'll be able to, to really work together. And also just to, to, to indicate the Foundation for Human Rights is, is, is working on a project that is called Masivan Bisani, which is, uh, uh, is about empowering um, local communities to be able to strengthen their response 
uh, to gender-based violence within their own communities. So I think that's also another really significant thing that we need to be able to ensure that people on the ground are able to find solutions, are able to respond to incidences of gender-based violence without having to to always look at somebody else or always look at government or somebody else to come and 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 have the answers but for them to be also involved in that way they would be able to also call upon government and call government to account to say look this is what needs to happen in our communities the foundation for human rights is also running uh, um, an animation series and the website is called keep it constitutional dot co dot uh, z a which is also about uh, human rights it's also about teaching learners of school going age about their human rights it's very very important like what joy said it's very important that people understand their human rights and only then will they be able to claim them thank you Thank you. Your response reminds me of two sayings. One is you chew the elephant one piece at a time, and the other is small is beautiful, which is a book which I know when I was a, at a high school, there was this book, Small is Beautiful. And it comes back to we've got to start where we are at community level. We can tackle the whole system, but often we can't just dismantle everything all at once. So we start where we are. And also, as the VWE put it, we are in movements. And uh, if we have a movement like the UDF, then that scales the response up. I'll now ask Caroline uh, for her comments. Please, Caroline. Thank you, Zanadia. So for me, like, like many of the, uh, the previous, like Rumi uh, and um, Joy alluded to, it is about human rights. Again, if we look on the Cape Flats and communities, most people do not know their the human rights. Like, like, like with the IDP process, I just wanna go step back there. Nobody know even what IDP stands for. They come into the community, they drop something in the letterbox. There's no activism. So unless the few of us so that loves, I live in Bridgetown and I work in this community. So unless someone like me or a few others in the community know what's happening and we then, then lobby others to be part of the process, that IDP just happens. And exactly like Saviwe said earlier, activism is missing. So we look at patriarchy, GBV, we use all these international instruments and big words, but how does it impact us on the community, the women in the communities? We, we know that these bills before parliament, the review bills, the, the, the domestic violence act, the sexual offenses bills, and many others that is now being reviewed in parliament. So if we're saying gender-based violence to dismantle is gonna take the whole of society, why do we have academics? And we have all the experts speaking on behalf of women in communities. So I want to say we need to take a step back and bring, if we say this is women's voices, women's voices can't just be Caroline and Rumi and the Fatima Shabudins and Soraya Salia, she is on here, she's Bontival. We need to bring other women or, or really listen to the women's voices because we've been speaking far too long on a big stage and, and, and so all of us are needed. So we need the academics, we need the researchers because we've got lots of anecdotal stories. So for that reason, we need the research to substantiate an, an anecdotal. So I know all about that, but again, I want to say, we need to go back to the basics. We need to go back to the, to, to, to the women on the ground, to the women in the communities that we say, this is what women want, but did we come and listen to what the women want? And those are the things that needs to happen at IDP. We need activism. I was thinking last week when I was at the court protesting about bail for rapists before we could send them and that time even faxes. We sent around faxes and as women activists and gender activists, we were there. We would oppose the bail. We see our rapists are now released on 1,000 rand bail. 
you know, and, and, and so we can say GBV is this and that and have all this, but we need activism and we need activism, not just from, so how are we going to almost mentor the next layer of activism to come? We know we became activists from school with a struggle. So we were brought into that. How do we make sure that that communities there's, there's almost an uprising. We speak about the GBV pandemic. We speak, of, where's the outrage? Where's the outrage? We all don't, we don't want to become uncomfortable because it's not a good space. We need to be uncomfortable. We do not want to say things because we, we, we too afraid to offend. We, we, we too afraid to lose, to lose favor because we all sitting in comfortable positions, you know? So we need, activism we need activism in in schools we need to teach our little children from young because remember perpetrators is our brothers our partners our our nephews we we need to speak up we need to speak out we need to teach our children and and, and this is what really struck me in the week too, when a young girl phones in to the radio station and she says, hello, Aiden. Other children says, hello, Uncle Aiden. You know, so we were raised in a community where everybody is our auntie and uncle, you know, and it shouldn't be so anymore because we know better. So I want to say activism, we need to educate from a young age, young boys, young men. So all those education. Anyway, Zanaria, thank you very much. I can go on and on and on because it's something I'm very passionate about. Thank you, Zanaria, and thank you, CCC, for this opportunity and platform. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. You, you're very passionate about this, I can hear. And activism has come through more than once in this particular discussion. Aslam, Aslam said earlier, gender justice, uh, the, the, the struggle lies in all spheres of our community and I, I like that particular statement. Um, but Aslam, your, your closing comments. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for raising that point so I don't have to say that again. But I'll make a slightly more not mundane point. I'm an educationist so I always ask myself um, where's the educational potential in anything? And the one thing that I want to propose is popular culture and a conversation around popular culture. Remember young people uh, exist via social media and popular culture and memes and posts and so on. But I want to turn your attention to something that you may or may not be aware of, and that is the gefufa, the gefafo, uh currently playing itself out on the St. Worcester Sopi. Now, whether you think the St. Worcester Sopi is aesthetically pleasing or it is very good art, I think it's raising in a very visceral popular cultural way the question of polygamy, the question of gender violence. And if you look, as I have, this is my research, by the way, I'm not a Facebooker, um, look at the Facebook comments on the St. Worcester platform. The women um, and some men um, have personalized, they've written themselves into that story. So they won't say, but uh, they won't make a comment on the aesthetics of the story and whether the story is junk, but they write themselves into the emotions that's experienced by people who are at the receiving end from a, a situation that is, that is misogynistic and it is unequal. What that tells me is, and, and, and the way that worked in my family and, and, in, and in some of my uh, conversations with many people, is that it raises the fundamental dilemmas of our social practices when we enact those practices and what they lead to. The hurt, the violation, the violence, psychological abuse, the emotional abuse that attends to that. So popular culture often is a text that's kind of thrown to you, you consume it, but if you ask serious questions about it, that's, that's, that's potentially the most powerful conversations that you can have uh, uh, in the way you problematize the way society functions and how it ought to function or to function uh, in, in much, much more productive ways. Thanks. Ah, thank you. So, I mean, we've really been given much food for thought, some new ideas, some old ideas, but brought to the surface again. Um, and the call for activism, the call for multi-sectoral approaches, the call for essentially us raising these issues and, uh, you know, if it's a pandemic, GBV is a pandemic, to give it the kind of attention that a pandemic, as we know with this pandemic, uh, we were at lockdown level five going to one, but we were very aware of all the actions, the masks, the 
all the things we needed to do to protect ourselves. Um, and if this is such a pandemic, one can imagine there must be attention and the people that will put the attention are the kinds of people that are on this particular platform today. Not only the panelists, but even all the people commenting uh, in the chat and I'm sure on Facebook as well. So um, there's much food for thought, for engagement, for further uh, discussions around this and more, more than discussions for movements, for challenging uh, the status quo. And I want to thank all our panelists today for making themselves available on a sunny Saturday afternoon uh, to be here. Thank you very much for your time, for your thoughts, for your effort, and to all the participants, uh, audience on both the Zoom and Facebook platform. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, and thank you for your many comments in the chat. I've seen lots of interesting engagement between panelists and audience, and um, I'm sure this will be the first of more to come. Thank you very much, everyone. Good afternoon and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Go out into the sun with your masks, people, but enjoy the rest of the sunny afternoon in Cape Town. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi, Suraya. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful. The sun is setting here. Lovely comments coming through still. Uh, Really quiet conversation. Thanks for excellent panelists. Thank you so much. Very engaging discussion. Uh, yeah, so we need to keep doing these things, people. There's lots of room for us to do these things. Lots of need as well. Thank you.